Hello and welcome back to FPV Reviews. Today we'll be assembling the T-tail structure for Gemini V2 from the laser cut kit from Flying Squirrel Models. By now we already have the parts from the kit laid out in an orderly manner so that we can see the part numbers. If the fuselage is already complete, good. However, if not, no worries as you can always come back later at the end of this video to see how to integrate it to the fuselage. We'll want to have the plans sheet called Gemini V2 Tail Feather Kit Assembly Detail printed full size. And as with the fuselage, we'll lay it on a flat surface covering it with a sheet of clear plastic. Locate part number R1, R20, and R5, laying them over the plan and gluing them in place directly over the plan for precise alignment. Only when the glue is thoroughly dry, lift the assembly off of the plastic sheet. Locate part number R13. Do put it in place, but do not glue it to the assembly just yet. Now, locate part number R28 and lay it flat on the bench, plugging the front end of the assembly into it and precisely centering the rear of the assembly to it. Use two squares to make sure the parts are at a 90 degree angle to each other and glue in place. Now we can go back to part R13 and glue it into place permanently. Next, locate part number R26. Apply glue to the top, bottom, and rear of it, then slide it into position as accurately as possible by eye. If it's not absolutely perfect, don't worry. If it's close, that's good enough. Now locate part number R16, and we'll need a couple of machine screws to fasten the horizontal stab to the vertical stab too. We want to locate this hardware now, as the nuts will be buried inside the vertical stabilizer. If possible, use 832 by 2 inch machine screws and source a couple of 832 blind nuts part number 347 from Dubro as well. If it's not practical, other sizes can be substituted and we'll show you how to use regular nuts if you're unable to find the recommended hardware. In this case, we'll be using some 1032 by 2 inch hex cap screws and normal 1032 nuts from the hardware store along with their steel washers. It will help to put some clear grease or oil on the threads as we'll be gluing the nuts into the structure. Now go ahead and insert the screw into part R16 with a nut on each side and a washer on the side that we'll be applying the glue to. The nut should be snug but does not need to be fully tight. If you have a piece of silicone tubing or automotive rubber vacuum hose, press this firmly over the exposed threads. Otherwise, take several wraps around with some painters or electrical tape to keep the glue from getting on the threads. Now apply CA glue or epoxy all around the nut to encapsulate it. Do the same for both nuts. When you're sure that the glue is dry and the nuts are secure, then remove the tubing and screws. Now locate part number R14 and R15, slip them into place in the framework and glue them. Also apply glue to the flat side of part R16, being careful not to get any on the nuts and centering it carefully. It helps to use a couple of clamps to hold it in place while the glue dries. The holes in R16 should line up with the notches in R20, and the parts should be square to each other. Next, locate parts R3A, two of them, and R4A, also two of them. Note their positions on the assembly detail drawing. Glue them into place, but for the moment, only glue them to parts number R28 and R13 initially.
Only after all four are glued, you can stand the structure up and squeeze them in towards the other ribs evenly, gluing them into place one pair at a time. Make sure they line up accurately as they are glued to part R16 and R20. When the glue is dry, locate parts number R3B, two of them, and R4B, also two of them. Apply glue and clamp them over the previous set of parts, preferably in this order. Now locate parts number R2, two of them, and glue them to the structure, clamping them securely one side at a time until the glue is dry. Next, locate parts number R6 and R17 and glue them into place, centering them by eye to the best of your ability. Again, if they're not perfect, it's okay as long as they're close. We'll now locate parts number R7, two of them, R8, R9, R10, R11, and R25. Part R25 is glued to the forward edges of the forward spar as a stiffener. Try to center it as best you can by hand and eye. Next, glue number R10 in like manner to the edges of the rear spar, centering it so that there is an equal gap on both sides. Also glue part R11 to the bottom of R13 as far back as possible so that there is no gap between it and the part R10, also centering it so that the gap on each side is equal. Do the same thing on the bottom with part number R9. Now part R8 can be glued in to form a box. Glue in also one of the parts numbered R7 to form one side of the box followed by the second part number R7 on the opposite side. This block is not necessary, but will help you guide the bolt as it's inserted to make assembly at the field a little easier. You can also wait until later. As we'll show, the hole can be drilled later with the stab in the fuselage after it's built, and the wood block can actually be inserted then too through the lightning holes. This is the preferred method to ensure that the alignment of the bolt in its hole is perfect. That's why the newest revision of the kit does not have a hole drilled in part number R7 for the bolt. At any rate, if you do insert the optional wood block at either stage, it's best to drill it only halfway through on each side to ensure proper alignment of the hole. Then it can be drilled straight through and it will be aligned properly. Now we'll find some scrap 1 16th inch balsa sheeting and use it to make some cross grain webbing for the front of the forward spar and the rear of the aft spar. This is optional, but does help to reduce aeroelasticity in flight. Most builders will not notice any difference, but we like to do it anyway as it's easy and adds very little weight to the aircraft. We can now locate and glue in part R12 and R24, both flush with the adjacent parts. It's recommended to install both on the left side of the vertical stab. This standardizes the direction that the servos move the control surfaces and lets Arduplane users and other autopilot users share parameter files easier without having to reverse servo movements in software. Now is the perfect time to make the reliefs in part number R20 using a hobby saw or sharp number 11 exacto blade. The important part here is that it clears the screws and does not interfere with them. Next, use some scraps of quarter inch balsa from the kit to fill in around parts R16 and R20. Carefully sand the top flat with a sanding block making sure that it's still flat from side to side and the top angle of incidence is not changed. Sand as little as possible to make it flat. Locate part number R21, lay it on top of the stabilizer and thread in the tail bolts. 
Use it as a pattern to mark and shape the blocks toward the rear. Remove and use a straight edge to mark and cut the blocks toward the front. These blocks will make a good surface for the covering material to adhere to. Now locate parts number R21, R22, and R23. Glue R22 to R23, making sure to align them carefully. When the glue is dry, drill them out so that the tail screws fit into them. Flip the assembly over and use the screws as locator pins to align part R21 while it is glued into place. The screws can then be removed and the sides of the balsa block can be shaped using the top and bottom plywood plates as a guide. Now, glue can be applied to the top blocks of the vertical stab, taking care not to get glue near the screws, and the block we just assembled can be glued to it using the screws again to align and this time to clamp it. It's easiest to wipe up any glue that oozes from the joint now, as it will be much harder once it dries. So have a scrap of balsa or paper towel handy for the step. Now that the vertical stabilizer structure is complete, we can mate it to the fuselage. Locate the fuselage cutout pattern on the full-size printed plans and be careful to cut it out using scissors. Place the back of the pattern precisely at the rear of the fuselage sides and mark around its front edge and sides. Use a number 11 X-Acto blade to carefully cut away the fuselage sheeting to these marks. Insert the vertical stab into the fuselage and observe where it touches. You may have to trim just a little wood from the top of the fuselage, but you should get it to fit in very precisely in this position. It's very important that it lay flat on the bottom of the fuselage above all else so that the incidence of the horizontal stabilizer is not affected later. If the hole for the rear fuselage bolt has not already been drilled, it can be done now with the vertical stab held firmly in this position. It's best to drill from one side at a time as we discussed earlier, then through. Now insert an 832 by 2.5 inch long bolt, also using a steel washer on each side and two wood plates supplied with the kit, parts number 35, to secure the vertical stab to the fuselage. Gently tighten the nylon locking nut on the other side verifying that the vertical stab is still lying absolutely flat on the bottom of the fuselage. Locate part number 9 and parts 10, two of them. Glue part number 9 directly on top of one of the parts number 10. After the glue is dry, insert them into the fuselage underneath the tab protruding from the vertical stabilizer. Slide them back until they make contact with the tab. Apply glue to the outer edges, taking care not to glue the vertical stab in place. Remove the vertical stab from the fuselage and glue the remaining part number 10 directly on top of part number 9. Next, locate parts number R18 and R19. Lay down a sheet of plastic, then glue them together on top of the same flat surface to form the rudder. Here we've used six 1 8 inch Robart hinges, part number 308, and the Robart alignment tool to drill the holes. We've cut some small pockets into the wood to glue the hinges securely. Now you can go ahead and mount the high-tech HS dash 225 MG rudder servo and the Robart number 328 5 8 inch control horn making sure that it's a ball link is at exactly a 90 degree angle to the hinge line using parts number R27 from the kit as pads for the control horn. 
We'll use Dubro 440 stainless threaded rod part number 802 for the push rods. Dubro number 818 440 safety lock clevises. And Dubro number 2263 heavy duty 440 ball links to secure the push rod to the servo. We'll drill the middle hole on the dual servo arm. This gives plenty of throw for the control surfaces. Now bolt the heavy duty ball link to it using an extra washer on the back. Use your radio or a servo tester to center the servo and make sure that the servo arm is at a 90 degree angle to the push rod. Make sure the push rod is cut to the proper length and that it catches lots of threads in the clevis and also the ball link. For the horizontal stabilizer and elevator, first lay the full-size printed plans on a flat surface and lay a sheet of plastic over it. Locate the following parts, number E3, two of them, E4, E5, two of them, E6, two of them, E7, E8, two of them, E9, E10, E11, two of them, E12, two of them, E13, and E14, two of them. You'll also need two 6 millimeter by 1 millimeter by 1 meter long protruded carbon fiber strips. Laying the parts directly over the plans, start by gluing the two parts number E6 to part number E9. Do the same with parts number E3, two of them, gluing them to part number E4. Now, cut the carbon fiber strips to length using the plans to measure them. They can be cut using a hobby saw or hacksaw, but we prefer to use a Dremel tool with a cutoff wheel. Glue them in place to the edge of the corresponding wood parts over the plans so there are no mistakes. When dry, then glue parts E5, two of them, and parts E7 to part number E9, also over the plans. Glue part number E4 to those. Glue part number E10 to the assembly, followed by part number E13 and both parts numbered E12. Now both parts number E8 can be glued on, and lastly, parts number E11. The elevator halves, parts number E1 and E2, can be glued to each other. Use a straight edge to make sure the stabilizer and elevator are straight. Use the same process to install the Robart hinges at these points. Parts number E14 can be glued to the top and bottom now, or can be added after the covering is applied by cutting a section of the covering away. The horizontal stabilizer can now be bolted to the vertical stabilizer, the elevator servo can be mounted using its hardware, and the control linkage can be set up using the same principles and parts as for the rudder. Mount the elevator control horn offset slightly so that it cannot interfere with the rudder, even at extreme throws. Leave a margin here. The elevator should move to the same angular deflection up and down when the servo is actuated. It's also possible to use split control surfaces for V2 and dual servos to add redundancy to the system. Next time, we'll be diving into the build of the center wing section. Plans and kits are available at the links below, along with lots more information about the Gemini V2 UAV and our other advanced projects. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell icon for notifications. We've also got some exciting flights planned as soon as the weather improves, so stay tuned for that as well. Until next time, have a good one.